What is up my friends and thank you for joining me again for yet another build. Today we are going to explore how I made a miter dovetail box with my good friends Sam and Alicia who are both totally awesome by the way. So let's get busy. Now as always we begin with the milling process. This was actually a really really nice piece of curly walnut and I wanted to preserve as much of the material as I possibly could. So I measured out exactly what I needed for the box, took it to the bandsaw and made a stop cut but the blade got stuck in the kerf and I actually had to cut it away with a handsaw in order to get it off the tool, which was certainly less than ideal, but in the end, it worked. I then took it over to the jointer to clean up one face and one edge. And a little pro tip on the jointer when you're dealing with curly material, make sure you have sharp blades to avoid tear out. Next up, I took it to the bandsaw, and again, in the name of preserving as much of this wonderful material as possible, I cut away most of the meat that I wasn't going to use so that I could use it in a different project in the future. Once that was done, I took it to the thicknesser to clean up both faces and of course to the table saw to cut it to its final width and length. Now there are a couple of different techniques you can choose to use to cut things to the exact same length, the simplest of which would be to set up a stop block. But because I'm only making four cuts at two different measurements, a simpler solution for me here is to cut one piece to final length and then to stack that piece on top of the next blank, match up the ends, and take just a sliver off of the top piece. This gives me two pieces at exactly the same length. Now that I've got my pieces all cut to final dimension, it's time to mark out my dovetails. Now we're using a 1 and 8 pitch here, which is somewhere in the range of 7 to 8 degrees. When I hand cut dovetails, I tend to cut two tail boards at a time. This allows me to be more efficient with my movements as I'm cutting two sets of tails in the time it takes to cut one, but it also gives me a larger 90 degree registration for the shoulder so I can ensure my shoulders tend to be squarer than if I only cut one board at a time. Now a quick note on my favorite dovetail saw. I'll be honest with you and tell you that I'm lucky enough to own most of the major brands dovetail saws, and they're all really good. But my favorite saw is still a $20 crown saw that I bought years ago and reshaped and refiled the teeth myself. I just really like the way this saw cuts. Once the tails are cut, I like to use a knife wall method to lay down my shoulder lines. Now you can absolutely use a slicing gauge to mark your shoulders. I'm just not a fan of the line running across your dovetails in the end product. Now normally I remove the bulk of the waste with a coping saw, but because I'm always experimenting, I decided to try it out on the scroll saw this time. And it's finally time for the mitered section of the mitered dovetail. Now for some reason still unbeknownst to me, I had it in my head that this angle wouldn't be 45 degrees. Spoiler alert, it totally was. So just use a combination square to make your life a little bit easier. Short of that, it's just like cutting any other miter. After that, it was time to transfer my tailboard to my pinboard. Now I use a light underneath my tailboard to ensure that my shoulder is all the way closed, and then I use a knife to transfer all of my markings to my pinboard and mark those lines straight across with my square. This gives me a very definitive line around which I can cut versus using a pencil, which does have some thickness to it. Now the process of cutting your pins is very similar to that of cutting your tails. My goal when cutting dovetails is to have these tails fit off the saw, so I am cutting on my line. However, if you're just learning dovetails and you're a little reticent to cut right on the line, cut just inside the line and pair back to it with a chisel. This will allow you to sneak up on the line and really hone in on a perfect fit. Another quick tip is to make sure that your chisels are sharp. If you're dealing with dull chisels and trying to pair across end grain as you are on the shoulders, or even just clean up the cheeks of a dovetail, dull chisels are your worst enemy. You'll get sloppy results and you'll end up frustrated, so keep them sharp. Now back to the scroll saw. Part of the reason I chose to explore the scroll saw for this project is because I could get really, really close to that line and have an absolutely dead square shoulder. Now there's nothing wrong with using a coping saw, and of course I still had to use one to clean out the little bit of meat that was left over next to the pin, so it's a little bit silly to use the scroll saw admittedly, but it was an experiment, and as I said, efficiency is not my number one concern. 
And after removing the bulk of the waist with a scroll saw and coping saw, I still had to chop down my shoulders with a chisel to get them nice and square to be able to fit my tailboard. Now at this point, I didn't want to pull too far ahead of where Sam and Alicia were, because of course I was doing this project alongside them so they could see and learn the process. So I decided this would be an ideal time to mill up the top and bottom of the boxes. This way they'd be able to rest overnight and if there were any issues with movement, we could deal with them the next day before we assembled the boxes. My first move the next morning was to route the groove in the boxes in order to accept the top and the bottom. I did this over on the router table using a quarter inch straight bit that was about an eighth inch deep. Next, having let the top and bottom rest overnight, it was time to mill up to final dimension. I started at the bandsaw because I wanted to be very intentional about the grain direction and pattern in the top and bottom of this box. With a project as visually simple as this, little details like how you read the grain pattern can really affect the way that you feel about the overall piece. It can either feel balanced or unbalanced, resonant or dissonant, and I really just wanted to have a pleasant little object that somehow felt delicate and special. I then rounded the corners of the final pieces of the disc sander, just to ensure that nothing would get bogged down during glue up. I also decided to add texture to the top using a shallow gouge. Now this adds an extra visual element, but more importantly, it adds a tactile experience to the box, which I think is an often overlooked component of a piece that's meant to be picked up and handled. Now, let's take a moment and talk about glue ups. Either everything goes perfectly, which is obviously ideal, or everything goes terribly wrong and you're running around the shop like a madman with a hammer in one hand and a clamp in the other. So let's talk about a few tips on how to avoid the latter situation so you end up with a good project. Now one thing I do whenever I can is to dry fit my components together before the glue up to make sure everything's in place. However, with a piece like this, if I were to dry fit this thing together, I would never get it apart. So this is really a matter of making sure I have all of the components laid out in an order that I can access them clearly and quickly and understand the order of assembly that's about to take place. Now, as you can see, I'm not super stressed during this glue up because I understand my order of operations. I start by applying glue to the center of the top and bottom panel to allow for seasonal movement. Then I apply glue to the pin board before applying my tailboard. I spread glue across the shoulder and the cheek of the pin board using a small scrap of wood. And then I drive the tailboard home using a rubber face mallet, in this case, a dead blow mallet. After that, my goal is simply to make sure that I've closed both the shoulders and the miter using the dead blow mallet and that everything is driven all the way home. I place my clamping calls just inside the shoulder of the tailboard, which for a piece this small with such little clamping pressure runs very little risk of warping the piece. At this point, it was time to take a little break and get Sam and Alicia caught up and ready to glue. They had both been working really hard to cut some seriously good dovetails, so I wanted to stop and help them to make sure that the glue ups went off without a hitch. So now's as good a time as any to mention that Sam and Alicia also both made videos of their projects. So make sure you pause this video, head on over to their channel, and check out what they're doing. They're both genuinely awesome people who made some really good projects for the first time ever hand cutting dovetails, and I'm confident that you're going to like what you're seeing over there. So check them out. I gave my box a couple hours to set up and then it was time to take it out of clamps and this is where I always start to get excited. It's starting to really look good, but first I had to make a small repair to my box. When I was routing the groove for the top and bottom, I got a little too close to the end of the tail and I actually blew out a small section of it. So I cut a little wedge from an offcut, shaped it to fit the hole, and drove it in to fill the gap. A tip my teacher once gave me is to always keep the off cuts of your pieces until that finished piece is out the door because it is extremely hard to color match from tree to tree or even board to board. But once I filled the gap and cut it flush with a saw and a chisel, that mistake went away forever. That secret's between you and me now. Then I took out the trusty old block plane and cleaned up the rest of the pins to make sure that the box was flat because the next step goes to the table saw. Then it was time to separate the lid from the box. Now there's a few different techniques you can use, including the band saw or just a hand saw, but I decided to cut a kerf around the entire box of the table saw. The depth of cut was about a sixteenth less than the thickness of the wall so that it wouldn't collapse in on the blade on the final cut. I then took it to the bench and separated the lid with a Japanese pole saw. It's a box. Mm.
Mmm, it's a box. <laughs> and, if I don't say so, it's a sexy box. <laughs> Now any technique you use is going to leave a little bit of cleanup afterward, and this particular technique leaves a small shoulder on the inside of the box. But that's nothing that can't be cleaned up with a good sharp block plane and a little bit of sandpaper on a flat surface. And you know you're starting to get close when you sand your project, but we're not quite at the final sanding stage yet. First, we have to infill the box. Part of what I wanted to avoid with this project was creating a front or back of the box. Consequently, I didn't want to put hardware on this. One way to get around this issue of locating the lid without hardware is to create an infill for the lid to sit in and locate on. Now I used curly maple for the infill, which has the added benefit of really popping. And when you open this box, it looks like a treasure trove. It is just glorious. After I glued in the infill, the lid was a bit snug, so I took a shoulder plane and just took off a pass or two, and then the lid fit perfect. And now we come to the final sanding and finishing stage, which, even if tedious, is always exciting. But of course, we had been together for two days and working our butts off, so you know we got weird here. Not to say we weren't weird before, but still. Hey, well, it's to messengers how I learned how to ask a girl out. <laughs> Needless to say, that skill did not transfer well. Hello, America. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moment of truth. So sexy, you got that. Do the sexy music. Ouch, goodbye. We need boys to men on right now. <laughs> Funny you should say that. Funny you should say that. <laughs> now friends, I wish that I could play for you the onslaught of karaoke that happened shortly thereafter as we were singing to boys to men, to Billy Joel, to Spice Girls. But alas, YouTube would take this video down if I were to do so, so suffice it to say, we absolutely crushed it. Now there are a myriad of appropriate choices as far as finishing goes for a project like this. Shellac, white balm varnish, Danish oil are all fine. We used an oil wax blend mostly because it was what I had on hand. I love the depth of color you get from oil-based finishes and the level of protection for a box like this is perfectly appropriate. So friends, thanks for coming by for another build. As always, I appreciate your time and your support. If you want to support me more, please make sure to subscribe to the channel, like this video, and comment down below. And do check out Sam and Alicia. I'll put a link down below to their channels. They are two genuinely awesome people, and I could not be prouder of the boxes that they came up with in the end. So friends, thank you as always. I hope you had fun, and Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. I will talk to you all next time. Peace. Yeah, Billy, drop that number yeah. one hit. Do you know the words? Yes. Every <gasps> word. Challenge accepted, please. Please. Are you serious? You really want to do this?